book of Ruth is one of the most beautiful books in all the Bible. It has a wonderful story in it. I get some books of the Bible, and I read them and read them and read them and read them and read them. It's like First and Second Peter right now. You read them over, read them, read them, read them, read them, read them. And you'll be surprised how that begins to develop in your mind, how things come out of that scripture that you overlook. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Lord, bless your word now. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. A little bit of a historical context, the time of the judges happened after Joshua died. A new generation rose up that did not know the Lord. What happened was that they just simply uh, degenerated. The book of Judges is a terrible book when it comes to serving God. God would raise up a judge, they'd get right with the Lord, and then they'd fall away and cry out to God, and their enemies would come against them. God would raise up another judge, and this went over and over and over and over again. Until Samuel, the Bible said Samuel was the last and the greatest of all the judges, and he was by far. But this is during this period of time when there's chaos in the land. The reason for that is because of the rebellion of the people. There was a famine in the land. God sent famines. And you can study them throughout the Bible. You'll find that when God, when God sends a famine, for the most part, it's to judge his people because they have been unfaithful to him, turned to the pagan gods around them. Back then, folks, that was a big deal because the famine in those days meant starvation and death, nothing to eat. They couldn't go down to the local Kroger's and buy something. That was it. And so famine in the land, you notice that they had to leave their country, and they went into Moab. Moab, of course, and Ammon came from Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughters. Moab and Ammon. So therefore, it starts out with a bad testimony. It's a bad thing. But the famine drove them into the land. Now, here's the thing to see about a famine. God can bring a good thing out of a bad thing. We're going through a famine right now. There's no question about that. We're going through a famine. We will get through it. Probably the Lord will come back and get us. But whether he does or not, we will get through this. If you'll remember, I told you Jack Keane, four-star general, told you Sunday morning that he says that China has weaponized this coronavirus. And I believe it. He has wept. They have weaponized it. Now they're sending seeds into this country. Sending seeds into this country. If you get a packet of seeds from China, do not plant them. Because some of the, the, ex, the professionals and the experts have said that those seeds could wipe out a harvest. They could be weaponized seeds. And uh, what I'm worried about tonight is when will the government do something about this? I mean, it looks like China has declared war on the United States. But in any event, there was a famine in the land. There's a famine in the land now. But God used this famine to bring Ruth out of Moab. And it's a beautiful story. Because Ruth told Naomi, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where thou, where thou diest, I will die. And so she literally left the darkness of Moab behind. Now, this illustrates a point that's taught in the book of Romans, chapter number 2. People will not come to the truth because their deeds are wicked and they don't want the truth. They'll come up with all kinds of excuses. They can give you theological arguments till you turn blue in the face. But the bottom line is they don't really want the truth about themselves. But she did. She knew where she was was a miserable place. She knew that Moab and Moab's gods were horrible, bloodthirsty, monsters. Shamash was the basic god of Moab, and, uh, and, and among many others. And you can read in the Bible about, uh, for example, the king Misha of Moab in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 27. He sacrificed the crown prince to avert a military disaster, his own son. This is the kind of world that she was living in. And so Ruth turned her back on that and said, Your God has got to be better than the God that I grew up under and the God of this land. Now they found what's called a Moabite stone. They found it in 1868 at Dibon. The Moabite stone is important, and I'll read some for you tonight. Say, so why is it important? 
It's written in the first person. It is Misha, a king of Moab, talking about his God, Shamash, and his exploits with Israel. Yeah, with Israel. The, uh, his victories over Israel and all of that. You see, what we're talking about here tonight is an extra-biblical, outside-the-Bible authority to the historicity of the Scripture. That's what you got. In other words, outside the Bible, you've got a record that agrees with the Scripture. It's like the Siloam inscription there in the, in the pool of Siloam. When they saw written in, in uh, Paleo-Hebrew, they saw it written on the side there in the stone, how that the axemen could hear each other's axe. And finally they came together and they opened that up so the water could flow. And that happened. It's in the book of uh, Hezekiah does this in the book of Kings. He talks about how that they opened up the tunnel so the water could flow. And this is an extra biblical support for the scriptures. Folks, the Bible is historically correct. Make no mistake about that. But listen to what he says in the Moabite stone. And he says, in Karcho, I made his high priest for Shamash, because he has delivered me from all kings, and because he has made me look down on all my enemies. Omri was the king of Israel. That agrees with the Bible. Omri, king of the northern tribes. Omri was king of Israel. He oppressed Moab for many days, for Chemosh, or Shamash was angry with his land. And his son succeeded him, and he said, He too, I will oppress Moab. In my days he did so, but I looked down on him and on his house, and Israel has gone to ruin. Yes, it has gone to ruin forever. Well, of course, that's wishful thinking. Believe me, that's wishful thinking. By the way, have you met any Moabites lately? No, you haven't, and you won't. Is Israel a reality? You better believe it is. But listen to this to give you a spirit and atmosphere of that day. And Chemosh said to me, Go take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night, and I fought against it from the break of dawn until noon, and I took it. Now listen to this. And I killed its whole population, 7,000 male citizens and aliens, female citizens and aliens, and servant girls. For I had put it to the ban of Ashtar Chemosh. In other words, it was sacrificed unto them. And from there I took the vessels of yod Hey wow Hey Jehovah. And I hauled them before the face of Chemosh. There you are. Can you imagine now that kind of world? You can't sit here in 2020 and judge the world of the 9th century B.C. by your standards. You can't do it. Just like you can't sit here and judge the world of 1850 by your standards. You can't do it. Or 1776 by your standards. You can't do it. Uh, history progresses and things are not always, they change. And so here we are tonight talking about a Moabite woman who made her choice to come out from under this miserable, dark, satanic religion and homeland and was willing to leave everything behind. Now, I don't know what all she left. I know her husband, that was a Jew, had died while they were in Moab. But she, no doubt, had a mother and a father, maybe a sister, a brother, a family members, And she turned her back on them and chose to leave Moab. Did it do her any good? Yes. She became the great-grandmother of David the king. I'd say that's quite a choice his great-grandmother. And here's something else I want you to notice about that tonight. The Jew, in the midst of all of this, now keep in mind, this is polytheism. All of these nations around Israel were polytheistic. In other words, many gods. But Israel was, hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. All right? One Lord. So they, they were what you would call monotheistic. All right? Now here's what's important about this. She was a Moabite that came into the Israelites. And in Matthew chapter number 1, she winds up being in the very genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. God intended to preserve his word, and he preserved it. He used the Jewish people to do it. 
But he wasn't that much interested in pure racial identity because we got a Moabite, we've got Rahab the harlot, we've got Canaanites, we've got Hittites, we've got all of that. His concern was preserving the word of God and he chose the Jewish people to do it. And this is how she was able to come into the land. Because if they said only Jews, only Jews can be in Israel and serve the Lord God Jehovah, that would have excluded her, that would have excluded Rahab, that would, ex would have excluded a lot of them. But the house of God was open to all men if they sought him. Do you remember the New Testament where the Greeks came and they said, we would see Jesus? Do you remember that? We would see Jesus? The Greeks did. The Bible said when he went to the cross, he tasted death for every man. Christianity is not a racial religion. It's not about race. It's about humanity. Amen. We are sinners. And that's why Christ went to the cross to pay for the sin debt. Famines in the Bible teach quite a lesson. For example, Joseph was in, was in, was in, uh, was in Egypt and a famine came into the land. Where? Came into the land of Israel and all the other lands around there. But God gave Joseph a vision. He gave him a vision. Seven years of plenty and then seven years, seven years of, uh, of, uh, of, of hunger. Did you know that they have found ancient Egyptian records that date back to the time of Joseph that talks about seven years of famine? Think about that. Over and over and over again, they find archaeological discoveries that, in, that, that uh, agree with the word of God. So Joseph was in the land because of a famine. God made sure that he would be there because of a famine. His brethren had a bad purpose. They sold him because of envy. But God used it and turned it to good. Just like he's going to take this plague that we're living under right now. And he'll turn it for good. The Bible said in Romans 8 that all things work together for good. For those who love God. For those who are the called according to his purpose. You say, oh now preacher, what happens if the church just dries up and dies? Are you kidding? He said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Now people may dry up and die. A lot of the people that you know who profess to be Christians may dry up and die. But his church will not die. Make no mistake about it. They are by the mil millions, by the tens of millions in China, a communist country that persecutes them. There are many Christians in North Korea, a, 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 a fascist country that persecutes them. Your brothers and your sisters are all over this globe. You say, don't make the mistake of thinking that God is an American. <laughs> He's not an American. There's nothing wrong with being an American. But God's not an American. He loves the Chinaman just as much as he loves the Englishman. He loves the African just as much as he loves the Portuguese or whoever he may be. He loves all men. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So they found it. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But at the time, it didn't look wonderful to Joseph, did it? When Joseph was going through it, it didn't look good. I mean, he, his, how do you think he felt? How do you think Joseph felt knowing his brethren had sold him into slavery? Can you imagine? <coughs> that doesn't go too well for uh, uh, family relations, does it? Siblings uh, get along with each other. They hated him. Do you know why they hated him? Because he lived by vision. Joseph had visions. Joseph was able to see things they couldn't see. And once you're able to do that, that elevates you immediately above the, uh, those around you. We don't live by what we see. Paul said, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I was told the other day about a church in Alabama. They had a revival meeting. Alabama, Baptist Church, had a revival meeting. I lasted three, four, five days, whatever it was. Forty people, forty people in that church now have been tested positive for COVID-19. Forty of them. Now, I don't know if some of them are asymptomatic, you know, as they say, and some of them may be on ventilators right now. Who knows? But forty people have been tested and, uh, with, for COVID-19. All right. Now they were having a revival. 
They were serving the Lord. They were trying to do something for their soul spiritually. But God allows things to happen to us for our own good. Amen. Let me encourage you tonight about something. Don't shake hands with each other. Don't shake hands with each other. When you come into this place, treat it just like you're going to Walmart or you're going to the grocery store. Because you need to understand this, this, this plague is real. We got some nutcases on the internet calling it a hoax. That's, that's a nut. This is real, folks. And all you have to do is just a little research, and you'll, and you'll just listen to the doctors and the nurses. They'll take you to the facilities and look at the people on ventilators that are dying for this, with this stuff. No, it's no joke, and it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a hoax. It's real. Just exactly what all it is is debatable. Sure, but it kills people. And so what you need to do is to practice some simple, use some simple sense. Don't shake hands with each other. Don't get in each other's face. Practice that social distancing. It'll help. I think it makes a difference. And I encourage you to do that. But the reason I say that is because I want you to be able to come to church. I want to be able to come to church. Come to the church house. Just the other day, a place, uh, a bunch called, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Chain Smoker. Chain Smoker. I had no idea it was a band. But it, it's a band. And apparently it had met in New York or somewhere up in there. And all these people came in there to see it. And they were all over each other. You know how they are. They're, they're mosh pits and, and all. And here they are in that thing. In other words, they, they're telling people that there's a lot of people in this country that don't take this seriously. And, that, and they, think that they're, they think they're above it. And they don't really believe that it's that contagious. And it would be interesting to find out how many people will get infected from what, what happened at that place. And I think, it's, I think it's New York. If it is, the governor of New York is, is hopping mad, a Cuomo. I don't, I don't remember what. Does anybody know what state it was? Is it New York? New Jersey? Somewhere up in there. So um, uh, it's real. And, you know, as a pastor, I try to look out for your welfare. Be careful with each other. Sure, your family, that's, you know, you're together with your family, but... Uh, that's why families can sit together. That's no problem. <laughs> but when you're with somebody in this church, keep a distance, fellowship with them, but don't shake hands. We'll see what happens. Amen. God will do something good with this. Yes, he will. I don't, when I see somebody pass away, you know, I don't see any good in it except to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I haven't thought, I haven't, in the last few weeks, I don't know how to explain this to you. I've done more thinking about being absent from this body and present with the Lord. I've done a lot of thinking about it. Eight years ago, I was lying flat on my back with heart failure. And I thought I was dying at that time. But God has added eight years to my life. I don't know how long I'll be here. But I made a decision. And that decision was, I'm going to go to church if I come down with this stinking thing, I come down with it, but I'm going to go to church because that's more important to me than life itself. And I've been thinking a lot now about heaven. I have. I've been thinking a lot about the Lord, about where I'm going. I mean, I really have. I'm not just saying that. I really have done a lot of thinking about that. You don't know. You don't know how long you're going to be here. You may come down with a sneeze tomorrow and have you in a hospital in two or three days on a ventilator. Who knows? But where are you going when you leave this world? So I've got peace. That gives you peace. Thank God for that. Amen. Praise God for the peace that you get. Well, there's a famine in the land in the day of Abraham, too. Abraham went down to, in Genesis 12. Canaanite was in the land. And there was a famine in the land. He went on down to Egypt. Over and over and over again, God tells them, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. And so he brought him up out of Egypt. And when he came back, he went to Bethel and built an altar to God. And he worshipped the Lord as he had at the first. But the famine produced something, as famines always do. I want you, to, I want you tonight to, to hear what I'm saying about this. If the Lord doesn't come back soon, watch what comes out of this place.
plague. Watch what comes out of it. I'm going to tell you right now. I'll tell you right now. What comes out of this plague will be good for the church. The world, oh no, 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 no. Lord have mercy, if they thought they were going to die, what the devil said to the Lord, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin, that's 99% true because the world lives for nothing but the here and the now, and that's it. But it'll come, there'll be something good comes out of this. I don't know what it is, but it'll be good. And so you lose, either way, it's going to be good. If something good comes out of it, good. But if the Lord comes back in the middle of it, that's good too, right? Amen. Have you, been a, have you come out of Moab? How many of you came out of Moab? I came out of Moab. I, you know, I didn't just move up spiritually. I came out of hell. <laughs> Where I came from, it was dark. And I came to the light. And uh, thanks be unto God. Ruth, Ruth inspires me. She really does. She was a humble woman. She was a humble woman. She trusted the Lord. She embraced the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then she became the great-grandmother of David. And she shows up over there in Matthew 1. But Orpah, who was Orpah? Anybody remember who Orpah was? That's his sister-in-law, right? Mm -hmm. they, were, they were married to brothers, all right? And Orpah turned around and left Naomi and Ruth and went back to Moab. You can search the Bible from cover to cover and you'll never find her name mentioned again. She went into obscurity. That's it. She was finished. She went back to Moab. You realize tonight that you live eternal? You realize now what God's done? He's written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. You realize tonight that you have an eternal legacy now? Amen. You understand tonight that you'll never go back into the darkness? The Bible said that, that, that the memory of the wicked shall rot. You know that? That's what it says. The memory of, it's as if they never lived. When you get to heaven, your name in the Lamb's book of life, where the redeemed sing the songs of Zion, God will wipe the memory from your mind of those loved ones that you, that wound up going to hell. How many in here did not have a loved one went to hell? Isn't that sad? The Bible said he'll wipe the tears from your eyes. It's sad. It's one of the saddest things in the world to have a family member, somebody dear to you, somebody close to you, and you have no hope at all that they're in heaven. And the Bible says plainly that the memory of them, of the wicked, shall rot. They'll cease to, have a, to be acknowledged That's as if they never lived. It's as if they, they, they came on the scene for a while and then they're gone. Now, I want you to look at another uh, uh, famine. And this is a different type of famine. This famine's found over there where David uh, has a plague come over Israel. And this plague can only be stayed by the divine hand of God. And uh, what was it? David sin. For a lot of people wouldn't think much of it. It's like a census. He measured the people of Israel. What was he doing? He was looking to their strength. See, their strength instead of the strength of God. People started dying. But David had done something. He had bought the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. He bought it. He didn't take it. Aruna wanted to give it to him, but he bought it. And now that threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite was on top of Mount Moriah, where the temple st stands now, what's left of it. Temple Mount. That threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite is one of the greatest pictures in the Old Testament of the cross of Christ. It's a beautiful picture. Say, so what do you mean, preacher? The threshing floor is a place where the animals tread out the grain and have the oxen going around. And what they're doing is separating the chaff from the wheat. But what does the final separation is not the animal. It has to be tossed into the air. And when it's tossed into the air, the wind blows the chaff away and the grain falls to the ground or into whatever container they have. You see that wind that blows the chaff away is the Holy Ghost. There at the top of Mount Moriah where the threshing floor of Aruna, the cross is a threshing floor. 
It's a place that separates the chaff from the wheat. And what does the separation is the Holy Ghost. If you're born again in here tonight, you listen to the Holy Spirit. And He led you to Calvary. He led you to the cross. He always will. He's not going to take you anywhere else. All right? And it is at the cross that the wicked goes one way and the saved another. A split takes place. That's it. There is no way, no way, listen carefully tonight. Every human being that has ever lived or ever will live, when they come to that cross, they've got to go one of two ways. They either accept the one who died on that cross or they reject the one who died on that cross. By rejecting him, they're going the way to destruction, damnation. By accepting him, they're going the way of life, eternal life. And the Holy Ghost is the one who makes the difference. Because when the Holy Spirit comes on a person, think about Ruth. What did she have? The Holy Spirit comes on you, convicts you, gives you maybe not conviction to begin with, but just a little bit of light. You, you begin to see yourself in a little different light. You stop making excuses for your life and you start turning to God for some light, some help. And that's the Holy Spirit's work is to convict you and point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by bringing you to the Son of God, there you can be born again. So this is what John's talking about. Christ is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man. He says, neither cometh they to the light that their deeds might be made open or known. You have a choice to make tonight. You can follow the light you have and what's available for you. Or you can go back into Moab, into the darkness. His church will make it through this plague. It'll make it through. Don't you worry about that. His church made it through the black plague. His church made it through every other plague. And it'll make it through this plague. God will take some of them home. God will take some home. Maybe somebody in this house tonight. Maybe me. But the church will make it through this plague. And when you get on the other side, you'll do what Moses did when they stood on the shore of the Red Sea. When Pharaoh and his armies were buried at the bottom of the Red Sea, when the waters came together and shut them in and buried them, Moses stood on the shore and they sang the song of Moses, how that the victory is ours, the victory's been won. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Neither height nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen, folks. Amen. Either way you go, you can't lose. The song says, I'm a winner either way. That's the truth, though. It really is. Going up to be with Christ or going through it and then stand and rejoice in the victory. The victory that's been won. Father, bless your word. Bless your word tonight. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.